All right, do I have arguments on both sides? Thank you. human right and international bodies such as the United Nations should collect funds from developing nations to help provide, I'm sorry, from developed nations to help provide access to those nations who are too poor to facilitate national internet infrastructure or whose governments restrict internet access for political reasons. So the opposition will be arguing that the access to the internet is a fundamental human right and that um, Developed nations should support those who are not developed in developing their internet infrastructure, and they should also help those nations whose internet is restricted by helping them buy workarounds. Okay, proposition, you may begin. Your opening arguments, please. Uh, hey everyone, I'm Michael from the proposition side. Our topic today focus on, focuses on whether the internet should be a fundamental human right. But before I go further, I would like to tell you that it is already a fundamental fundamental human right in several countries, such as Finland and Estonia, with the government stating that the internet is essential in the 21st century. We as a group agree with this. We live, we're living in a digital age where we take the internet for granted. So why should some people be excluded from this electronic information society? Tim Berners-Lee, one of the creators of the World Wide Web, stated that access to the web is now a human right. It's possible to live without the web. It's possible to live without. It's not possible to live without water. But if you've got water, then the difference between somebody who is connected to the web and is part of the information society and someone who is not is growing bigger and bigger. Through four separate arguments, we as a group will try to convince you to take our side. Our first argument is how the internet supports freedom of speech, followed by our next argument of digital exclusion and inequality. Our third argument is about the link between education and the internet. And last but not least, our fourth argument, which will be about the relationship between the internet and other human rights. Before I hand the mic over, I'd like to leave you with a question to ponder for the rest of the debate. How would you be living without the existence of the internet? Would everything be just as convenient? Would you be as free? Would you be spending your life differently? Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for being here with us. Today's motion is, since access to the internet is a fundamental human right, international bodies like the United Nations should collect funds from developed countries to provide access to the nations that may be too poor to set up networks or under strict political intervention or censorship. To our team, there are several reasons not to support this motion. First and foremost, to some countries that are too poor to set up networks, the people there are very likely to be suffering the problems of hunger and thirst. It is more realistic to help the people with food and water to keep them alive. We are not denying how vital is the freedom to know, but it's of utmost importance to keep people alive before letting them explore the world. In addition, access to the internet is not the best way to improve productivity in undeveloped countries. To be more productive, we believe that a solid foundation must be laid through practice, 
Learning online only allows people to follow the tale of success, but not instructing them to develop their own success. Secondly, access to the internet may lead to a loss in local culture and uniqueness. People from undeveloped countries may simply copy everything that is found to be contributing to the thriving in developed countries through the internet. It is not for sure they will get their own countries flourish like the developed countries, but it is quite sure that they will lose their local special character and culture. Thirdly, series of individual and social problems may be generated by the internet in the countries that are too poor or ruled by arbitrary political power. For the individuals, a sudden availability of the internet may lead to addiction and overdependence. When more and more individuals suffer these problems, the society may be alienated. Moreover, for countries under arbitrary power or even dictatorship, the newly set up internet will simply be another tool for the government to censor thoughts and behavior. I hope I have offered a detailed layout of our team's opinion. We are going to elaborate more on each idea individually. Thank you. Okay, we are off to a good start. I like both of these sets of arguments. I think uh, you guys are anticipating what's going to be said, and uh, this is good. All right, uh, proposition, argument number one. People should not be deprived of their internet access as through the use of the internet, people get to enjoy the rights of freedom of expression. And if the use of the internet is absent in certain countries, this would be just the same as violating someone's human rights. The right of freedom of expression is recognized in international human rights law under the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the ICCPR. Article 19 of the ICCPR states that everyone shall have the right to freedom of expression. This right shall include freedom to seek, receive and impart information and ideas of all kinds, regardless of any frontiers, either orally in writing or in print, in the form of art or through any media of their choice. Since media is widely defined as the storage and transmission, or transmission channels or tools used to store and deliver information or data, it is a method of communication. Therefore, it is justifiable to categorize the internet as a form of a media of their choice. Hence, this shows the relationship between internet and freedom of expression. Furthermore, in a report to the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, the OSCE, on internet access as a fundamental human right, the author states that the right to freedom of expression must be, a universe, uh, must be universal, including the technology which will enable it, hence that, that would be the internet. Restrictions on this right or any mediums required to fulfill it should only be permitted if they comply to international norms. Uh, although, there, also, although it's debatable that censorship could be classified as an international norm, uh, there are different degrees of censorship in different countries, hence this argument is not, is not justifiable. Furthermore, the professor notes in the paper that extra measures should be taken to ensure that vulnerable, vulnerable groups, such as children and people that uh, live in a less economically developed country should, uh, should have access to internet. Uh, lastly, there are already countries that have established internet as their fundamental human rights. So to conclude my speech, I would like to quote, uh, to quote the Supreme Court of Costa Rica on uh, July 30th of 2010. They said that it can be said that these technologies have impacted the way humans communicate, facilitating the connection between people and institutions worldwide and eliminating barriers of space and time. At this time, access to these technologies becomes a basic tool to facilitate the exercise of fundamental fundamental rights in education, freedom of thought and expression. This would definitely require the fundamental, fundamental right of access to these technologies, in particular the right of access to the internet over the World Wide Web. Thank you. As many poor nations are short of basic resources such as food and clean water, our first argument is the United Nations should collect funds to help these countries to access these resources first, instead of helping them to build internet infrastructure. A lot of poor countries face issues regarding food shortage, lack of access to clean water, health problems, and housing problems. The residents cannot even fulfill their fundamental human needs such as food and water, and do not even have a place to live in. According to the United Nations, 25,000 people die of hunger every day. Nearly one in eight people are suffering from chronic malnutrition. 
is access to the internet a fundamental human right? Actually, the right to live is more important. There are more basic human needs. Without food, a human will be weak and cannot survive. Without clean water, a human will be ill and his health is threatened. These needs are necessary, without which an organism cannot survive. According to Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of human needs, psychological needs are the most basic needs, which are the most important and should be met first. Access to the internet is indeed an important human right, but the protection of basic survival needs should be of paramount importance. Putting the significance of access to luxuries like the internet before fundamental survival needs is nothing but ridiculous. On the other hand, it would be a waste if the United Nations fund on internet infrastructure. People in poor countries may struggle to get the basic living needs first instead of using the internet. Some people may say that the access of internet can help poor people to acquire better production methods so that they can get food, water, and other fundamental needs by themselves. But actually, they can hardly advance in terms of production methods if there are no policies or government aid to help them in farming. Firstly, people in poor countries may have very low education level. Thus, they may not be able to distinguish a good production method online. Secondly, as the information on the internet has different standards of accuracy, they may be fooled to believe something fake and rumors. For example, the South China Morning Post reported that after the 2011 earthquake in Japan, rumors triggered many Chinese people to buy salt as defense against the radiation. Obviously, this is because people are not educated well, and they cannot distinguish a rumor is true or not. Without supporting government and good education, internet cannot help people to increase productivity. The second point is the correlation of digital exclusion and social exclusion. The definition of digital exclusion is the exclusion from the best use of digital technology, either directly or indirectly, to improve the lives and the life chance of all citizens and the place in which they live. First, vicious cycle. Digital exclusion adds force to the social exclusion and then creates horrible vicious cycle. Let me give you an illustration. Job opportunities. An unemployed man would find it very hard to get digital literacy. He might have been financially excluded. The lack of money indicates losing chance of learning and information communication and technology, or even having his own computer. That, that means he would be denied access to the numbers of employment positions, requiring IT knowledge and techniques for catching up the world movement like what we do in daily life, such as researching information on Google and sending formal business letters to another company to, through Gmail. The lack of digital sense leads to the reduction of his possibility of getting a job, and therefore further increase his degree of social exclusion. We can see nowadays, digital exclusion is more than low accessibility to a computer. It can have a strong correlation with social exclusion of a sizable segment of the population. Second, the inequality. Digital divides also separates the social class in an unfair manner. Take a real life example how digital divides um, affect the society. Zimbabwe, having an adult literacy um, of nearly 90%, which is among the um, highest in Africa, the internet usage rate there is only 15.7%. That means in the total, ex total population of 1.2 billion, only 1.9 million people can enjoy the high quality public service delivered efficiently. So how about the rest of them? The other 1 billion people are not able to surf the net. The level of digital sense defines people not only by the job opportunities I have mentioned, but also the level of social class. Some of them may finally lead the advanced development of the country. The inequality of digital sense will finally lead to the trending of social exclusion within one society. Thank you. Okay, uh, opposition, argument number two, please. 
I am Bosco Ho, and this second argument is about the addiction of internet and dependence on technology. The internet, our usages, have increased to the point where more than 2 billion of the world population is now using. Yet more than one fifth of their time is spent on social networking, such as Facebook and Twitter. The internet now impairs young, people, young people's mind. They are suffering from the addiction, which leads to lack of concentration, creativity, and bad education. In 2012, about 11,000 teen Chinese teenagers in Beijing were interviewed using different evaluations of diagnosis. And I found the link between the decrease in well-being along with internet addiction, in which students with lower self-esteem and depression have internet addiction. The research is about illustrates just how harmful internet could do to one's well-being for less developed parts of the world when they are being exposed to an overflow of information. Citizens will be very easily addicted to it. More and more of what they want and need are easily accessed. But is this a positive thing? Do you want people to be at their homes obsessed with the internet and not being out there helping to society when it's most needed? To individuals, the aiding from internet does not assist their everyday lives, but impairs their physical body and psychological mind. Eyes and muscle fatigue can cause the inability to perform the physical work they needed to do. This, addition, uh, this addiction then further leads to a jeopardy of attention spans to individuals, as they realize that the real world responses are not as quick and exciting when compared with the internet. They're, they tend to return to fast action and reaction motion screens and images only a click of a mouse away. Let's think deeply into the situation. When individuals get addicted to, to the internet, they cannot learn and work as efficiently when their brains are dissatisfied by the real world they live in. Difficulties arise from acquiring advanced knowledge or even finish up their work as it takes a long time. Quality and quantity of work produced will not be as good as before. Therefore, the economics, quality of life, and lifestyle will change. Please bear in mind, the United Nations collect funds from developed nations to help themselves and others in need. But if this operation backfires, it could cause worse development to the economy of the area. When nations itself are too poor to facilitate, we aim towards the basic needs instead of providing access to the internet, that couldn't aid them properly. Thank you. Okay, proposition, argument three. Um, I believe that internet is a fundamental human right from the education perspective. According to the United Nations, education is a fundamental human right and is essential for the fulfillment of all the other human rights. In the past 10 to 15 years, the involvement of the internet played a major role in revolutionizing the education system. It has reformed the traditional practice of education into a more advanced and highly efficient one. With the development of society, the relationship between internet and education will be increasingly inseparable. Therefore, we believe doubtlessly that an access to the internet is um, indeed a fundamental human right. By providing an equal access to the internet, well, to some extent, improve the education system in terms of equal access and efficiency. At the beginning of the 21st century, 98% of secondary schools in the United States and the European Union were connected to the internet. Doubtlessly, this major investment in the education system is based on the great advantages that internet brings to education. Although the advantages are various, I want to emphasize mostly on how does education and internet jointly helps developing nations. Firstly, the ability to access a huge amount of information from vital resources all over the world would help poor nations to compete with other nations and thus climbing the social ladder. Internet is not only an access to websites, but also provides knowledge and information on every aspect of the educational world. Those resources are very efficient for professionals and students to gain knowledge and also a way for students in developing countries to understand the world, at least more than traditional education. They will have a chance to compete with students from developing nations and thus they um, poor, so without internet, poor would still remain poor. And similar to the second advantage, the providing of the international education, which means students with different backgrounds have a chance to access online educational courses provided by universities. For example, the online course of Harvard University. Therefore, I believe this involvement of new form of education will assimilate the traditional education system with its high efficiency 
and will help poor nations to develop if they have the right to access the internet as every one of us has in the world. Moreover, if we focus on the idea of equality of education, developing nations have the right to access the same quality of education as other nations do. As the United Nations also pointed out, it is obliged for government to implement more effective uh, education strategies, which means internet access. Therefore, I believe the next World Conference will not only hold on education for all, but also provide internet education for all, which say internet is a fundamental human right among all people. Thank you. Here to talk about the argument uh, about the social problems that would arise from providing internet services to poorer nations and nations whose access to the internet is restricted by governments for political reasons. Uh, the first being when poorer nations are uh, given access to the internet, a great no a greater number of people are susceptible to online scams such as the price screening advertisement, computer viruses, and junk mail. Uh, these individuals may download files and accept cookies in the browsers without realizing the consequences. Secondly, access to the internet means the user is more likely to receive rumors or biased information through social media. A good example of this uh, uh, would be Coney 24, which is spread to Facebook and YouTube. Is the internet is declared as a fundamental human right, more people are likely to use that information and cause an unnecessary outrage and form conspiracy theories, theories such as the US invading Uganda to capture Kony, who wasn't even in the country at the time the video was released. One of the advantages of the firewall in China is that it stops at least partially uh, from uh, that kind of uh, information from spreading. Finally, uh, uh, my third point would be limiting the, the citizens' access to the internet is one of the ways for the government to control the population. Uh, the Arab Spring is going on due, largely due to social media. Demonstrators use social media uh, to organize the demonstrations. Thousands of innocent civilians have died to this revolution. The revolution in Syria started in March 20, uh, 2011 and still continues to this day. Poor, poor nations and nations, uh, such nations, uh, may not have a stable, fair government. Uh, giving such nations proper access to the internet may spark unrest and possibly a civil war. Uh, we should not, uh, we cannot assume that all these political revolutions happen to bring in a better government. Instead, we should uh, focus on improving these countries through diplomacy, not giving them the catalyst for a revolution. Opposition. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. The opposition side mentioned three points. We will respond to them. The first point is that the the access to the internet is definitely cost to the efficient to, to the internet. Therefore, we should not develop have those developing countries to develop internet. But we would like to point out that internet efficient is the universal phenomenon, both it exists in rich and and poor uh, re regions, just like Hong Kong, as, as a developed region, we have heard a piece of news that a, a, a guy tried to kill his parents because of his internet addiction, and the parents tried to stop, stop them. And the second point is that, um, the second point that Professor Chan mentioned is that uh, the internet would try to, uh, we have people to spread junk argue, argue, advertisement and rumors. So we have to point out this. Uh, how, how people use internet and spread information is regarding his freedom of speech and still people have to be responsible for their speech on the internet. So therefore, um, in the, the access to the internet should not be of those developing countries should not be deprived be just because of this reason. And the third point is that the, the internet will trigger political ter turmoils in those developing countries. But we would like to say that other basic human rights, that's just like Right, the freedom of assembly is is still a free is, is a right of people, but it can be manipulated to help gather a revolution or other political activities. So therefore, should it, should it be deprived of just because of this reason? We don't think so. And we like to point out that the situation in some of the developing countries definitely requires U.S. money to have 
acquire access to the internet. One prominent example is China. China is not poor. She's the second largest economy in the world and, the first, and, the, and the, one of the fastest economy in the first three decades. It seems China does not require U.S. money in healthcare access to the internet. Yet, the reality tells a different story. China's internet censorship is considered more, more extensive and more sophisticated than any other country in the world. According to the data of Human Rights Watch, more than 60 internet regulations have been made, which are implemented by professional branch of state-owned ISPs, companies, and organizations, which is still called the Great Five of China. We will be according to how to study under such great file websites concerning foreign political issues are open censors. Falling Lung, post brutality, Tamil massacre of, of 1989, freedom of speech, democracy in Taiwan, 30 seconds. Independent, independence, Tibetan independence movement. Firstly, one core element of human rights, the freedom of speech is violated, as the Chinese government not only filters unfavorable websites, but also arrests people who say it or spread those information as a means of censorship. The arrest of Xi Hao, a Chinese journalist, because of his speech involved Tiananmen's massacre is a good example. To safeguard the fundamental human rights, external assistance has to be offered, which the UN in this case. The Chinese government makes use of such censorship. Thank you. Okay, opposition argument okay. Thank you. Hi guys, I'm Nari. Um, the last argument we have is that the access to the internet is not always the best fix to the problem because it will cause a predictable loss of culture that comes with the changing the size of people. This is best illustrated in the example of the introduction of television to Bhutan, allegedly the happiest place on earth. In June 1999, Bhutan became the last nation in the world to turn on the television, and in just a mere four years, the crime rate has skyrocketed. Marijuana was only ever used to feed pigs before the advent of television, and now hundreds have been arrested by the police for smoking pot. In an article in The Guardian, very fittingly named, Fast Forward Into Trouble, it is reported that cable TV subscribers are accusing television of smothering the unique culture and bringing about an uncontrolled society. Imagine watching a Mercedes-Benz advertisement every now and then, only to know that never in your life will you be able to afford a car like that. The introduction of television into Bhutan has brought about the reverse of happiness in the country by promoting a world that is, in, that is incompatible with our own, thus threatening the upholding of their local culture. In a media impact study conducted in year 2003, a young Bhutanese respondent confessed to be ashamed of speaking Zonka, the Bhutanese language with tears. I think we can all agree that the internet is a much more life-changing invention than the television. And if that's the case, it shouldn't be hard for you to envision the even more severe impact the internet can have on indigenous cultures. With the internet's ever-growing number of users, information shared online is only going to get more heterogeneous and penetrative. What is being disseminated is no longer just a TV drama that promotes distorted morals, but the insatiable desires that are born out of the exposure to the massive World Wide Web. Consequently, people begin to detach themselves from the local culture and opt for the quote-unquote modern standard. Be it economic or political aspirations, these hopes held by vulnerable nations may suffer a backlash due to the acute distinction between the utopia online and the highly restricted actual circumstance. How excruciating will it be if you can witness free speech online while knowing you can never exercise it in real life without sanction and penalty? However highly one may think of the internet, it is nonetheless a rash idea, rash idea to coerce people into adopting the information superhighway. When people are denied internet access, whether out of political or economic reasons, it is very likely that they're not ready for the upgrade anyway. Thank you. Proposition, your closing arguments. Uh, to, sum up, to sum up, I'd like to come back to the question I raised in my opening statement. How would you be living without the existence of the internet? Well, the truth is there are many people who are actually not living with, I mean, living without the internet right now. So is it fair to exclude them from this digital world just because they can't afford to start, start this? Should we not help countries whose, where the government's overuse of internet censorship violates other human rights? Should we leave these people behind? Thank you. I hope our team has offered you comprehensive reasons to oppose to this motion. 
In fact, the internet was originally a military experiment project by the U.S. Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. It is supposed not to be built for ordinary people like you and me. Moreover, other traditional media can distribute information like the internet. For example, newspapers are light enough to carry, and TV and radio broadcasts can provide light and sound stimulation. All this can replace the internet. It is also another concern that people may fall into a big web of individual and social problems associated with the sudden availability of the internet. With the above reasons, today's motion must not stand. Thank you. Okay, that concludes all the arguments on both sides in the opening and closing statements. Since we do have time today, let's open this into an inter- opposition-opposition debate, where you guys can respond to some of the allegations that have been made. I'm going to help to set the stage for that, so we can focus on a couple of things. Um, I'll start with um, start with the opposition. Um, I'm sorry, let me start with the proposition. Um, the, uh, the proposition has, in their first argument, um, noted that the internet is a key factor in the freedom of expression. Fact, it, it actually cites the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It's recognized international human rights law and international covenant on civil and political rights. Um, opposition, how do you respond to that, that argument? Uh, it is critical in, in helping us to express ourselves across the transnational borders. Um, so, what do you say about that argument that the proposition makes? The argument number one that freedom of expression is critical, it's a critical part of our human rights experience, and the internet enables that, and therefore we should enable the internet. Um, we do not disagree with the fact that the freedom of expression is essential, but then we think that the internet is just a lead to the end. It enables the freedom of expression, but it's not an end in itself. So for example, like you won't Say that you can like you won't say that access to the telephone is like a fundamental human right because you need to like communicate with other people. And telephone helps you to do that, but you won't say that access to telephone is a fundamental human right. Mm -hmm. Well, perhaps we do in a developmental sense. We do help countries develop their infrastructure and uh, certainly <coughs> communications facilities are part of that. Okay, um, proposition. The opposition says that you guys are pushing something that's not a priority. That we have people that are starving, that there are other resources that are uh, more critical that we should be focusing on before the internet. How do you respond to that? Uh, I think we agree with this, like putting food and all these hunger issues in front of the internet, but then there are also countries that already have these like physiological needs and uh, and they're just stuck uh, at a stage where they can't improve anymore because they're lacking the resources too. And I think the internet is a really good resource to maybe bring them forward instead of uh, just let them stay at this stage so that they can be, I guess, part, part of our world. Opposition, the proposition says that uh, when countries can't fully share in the wealth of the internet and the benefits that it brings, they face digital exclusion. That they are, in some ways, outcast nations, not able to advance economically uh, or in any other way. How do you respond to that? We do help other nations develop their resources, and, and we do help them to become uh, more competitive economically. So why not here? Why not? I'm not supposed to stump you. These are their arguments. <laughs> we all understood that, right? Digital exclusive. Well, um, like there's some tribes in America, they don't have internet at all. But <laughs> maybe, maybe it's like 
like an um, extreme, extremely um, example, but sort of like an sort of an investment on say if they have the potential to expand, become a like is it sort of a waste of potential? I mean, for some for some places, like um, even if you provide internet access to them, they may not expand like much. Uh, the aiming process isn't that as much. Okay, my BS meter is going on, so I'll, I'll do that occasionally. <laughs> All right. Um, proposition. The opposition says that the internet creates a culture of dependence on both technology and, and even kind of supersedes our ability to communicate and, and relate to each other. So helping to propagate this, this technology creates the same kind of problems that we have that are already facing, that we don't talk to each other. We, we can't do anything without the technology. How do you guys respond to that? Uh, I guess it's an issue that we have to face. Uh, like, but when the internet was first developed, I don't think we were too madly like in love with it. So I think uh, this problem definitely exists, and it's a risk when developing the internet in these countries. But then, uh, I think overall the benefits of my BS meter's gone off. It's gone off for both yeah. of you. Okay. Um, let me open it up to both of you briefly. Uh, is there any arguments that one side or the other has made that you want to take issue with now independently? Uh, opposition, take a contend anything that the proposition has said overall? Okay, your time is up. <laughs> got to respond to me somehow. Uh, proposition, you want to take issue with anything the opposition has come up with and weaknesses in their argument? Uh, I think they mentioned the loss of culture uh, and they brought up the, the, the Bhutan uh, example. I was just wondering uh, if we really develop internet and these LEDCs, do, Will internet be the real uh, the, the real cause of this loss of culture instead of like westernization or globalization? Is is like the true root cause the internet? Yeah, if you made the argument, you have to respond to it. <laughs> so uh, you talked about globalization and all that stuff, and basically, like the whole reason why globalization is taking place in Bhutan is because of the television, the introduction of television. So what I'm trying to say is that if you introduce, like, the introduction of television itself is the cost to globalization, which will lead to the loss of culture. Say that again. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. You can't but, get away with that. <laughs> like, because they introduced television to Bhutan, and that caused globalization. And that's why, like, That's why there's a loss of culture. You're calling it a slippery slope that we get with television going to the internet, but I'm not making your argument for you. Okay. Um, anything else? Anybody else want to take issue with any of these arguments? If not, let's pass it to the audience. We have mics. Okay, guys, grill them. Um, let me make a quick statement here. Because I think, for the most part, uh, with some exceptions, you've made good arguments, you've done your research, and it's great you come up here and you present them by reading them off your paper. I'm not the greatest presentations in the world. I mean, that goes for everybody here. Uh, you can make the full argument on paper, as I said, use your notes to extrapolate a little bit, but also your critical thinking requires that you be aware of each other's arguments. What are they going to say? Not spying on their work during the tutorial but anticipating what they're going to say, thinking about it and being prepared to counter it. That's 
start to work. Yes, I have a question for the opposition that you have mentioned that food and water uh, supply should be more important than internet. And then according to you that all the schools we have built in the poor countries should be included than the cash in for food and water. Oh, because as, as far as I see, we're not facing a resource crisis, rather we are facing resource uneven distribution. So I see there's no problem in asking the developed nation to fund the poor nations for both the food and water and also the internet. Um, I think that the food and water problem is a very urgent problem in undeveloped countries. So I think if the United Nations can um, can collect any funds, then the funds should be held um, to solve these problems first. You remember? Um, like, um, for example, in Africa, there are a lot of countries which both um, don't have food and clean water and other um, basic um, resources and also they don't have the internet so but a lot of people is dying um, because of hunger but it's not because of um, their lack of internet so which do you think is more important is of course they, they should be provide food and water first right so we have to put down all the schools and stop funding them so just to turn them into food and water they just they put it right? No. I think different developed countries are developing um, uh, in different um, process or the, the stage they are at are different. For example, some countries they are fully undeveloped that um, the people there are, uh, they do not have even enough food and water and some countries um, they can the people there can basically satisfy the, this physiological needs however um, if they if the children there receive no education they can um, they can just wait and consume the food and water they have and do nothing and uh, until um, they face another crisis that they are lack, lacking of food and water so um, and you said that uh, the, the undeveloped countries can ask for um, both the fund for food and water and the internet. I think that's a bit uh, <laughs> impossible because um, you can't just simply rely on others to provide you everything that you need. Okay. Thank you. Next question. Um, I have a question for proposition. Uh, you mentioned that um, education is revolutionizing and it is very important for everyone in developing countries to have internet access. But in many developing countries, not many people actually have the basic right to uh, access to education either yet, and uh, let alone access to internet and the new types of transferring education through the internet. It's not really common in developing countries. So why do you think it has such an important impact on education there? All right, somebody's thinking back here. Thank you. Firstly, I believe um, because as the development of the society, um, the education and internet is actually inseparable. So, yeah, there are students in developing countries who do not have the equal access to even to the basic education. But um, as the World Conference in 1990s, um, it has already noticed the problem and held a conference to uh, provide the equal access, the equal education access to the developing countries. So what I think is, um, they, in the future, um, they should not only provide the education, but also the internet and education jointly. Yeah. Final question. Um, okay, this is also for the proposition. Um, I would like to ask, um, how would you rank the importance of the internet in regards to many other 
things which the UN might be able to fund. Um, for example, roads, maybe like telephone communication, um, proper infrastructure like for education, food, water. Where would you rank it? Where would you place the internet? Uh, I think food and water should definitely be the top priority because without that we can't even survive. But then, uh, even though internet isn't on top, uh, it's probably even behind education, but then uh, it actually speeds up these kind of processes such, such as education, so I, I'll just put it right behind education. And as for roads and stuff, uh, I believe that uh, they are important, but then they, they should be they, they could be considered at the same rank as internet if, if I had to rank them. Okay. We've heard all the arguments today. I want to read you the proposition again one more time. That's just my phone. It's the police again. Uh, all the time. But I want to give you guys a chance to so formulate your thoughts here. The two leaders of each of the groups summarize your overall and strongest argument before we take a vote. I just want you to think for a second. Here's the proposition again. Debate number five proposition. Access to the internet is a fundamental human right and in international bodies such as the United Nations and collective ones of developed nations to help provide access to those nations who are too poor to facilitate national internet infrastructure or whose government restricts internet access for political reasons. Okay, everyone. So we're going to listen to the proposition. The idea here is the internet is an international human right, and that developed nations have a responsibility to help uh, less developed nations or those with restricted internet access to develop their infrastructure and to work around their restrictions. So the proposition will make a, a quick summary. Don't read your opening statement again. Don't read it again. Make the strongest argument you have to get these people to vote for you. Well, I believe in the 21st century, the, the internet is essential for us because um, maybe before the internet was invented, we could, uh, we could we could maybe access our human rights in other ways. But then now the internet is kind of it's essential for us to to do this. Like the Arab Springs, where we they they, they had to use the internet to express their freedom of uh, to ex express their views. So uh, our strongest point, I guess, is. Uh, the relationship between the internet and the other human rights. Okay. Opposition. Okay, after we still believe that food and water uh, are much more important than the development of internet in the developed countries, because um, if people, they got malnutrition problems, they cannot even concentrate on the development of their own countries and um, being educated, and also they may be struggling to get basic resources like um, uh, the problems that many countries are suffering is the need for clean water source, and this um, these fundamental resources are they are essential to the um, keeping people alive there. And we this is um, a very important point that we must. Um, um, okay, your time is up. Thank you. Okay, sorry, I know it's really frustrating when I do that one. Okay, you heard the arguments today. Um, there have been some interesting ones, there have been some weak ones. But now we come down to the real choice. With a show of hands in the class, keep your hands up. Who believes that the proposition have proved their argument today? That the internet is indeed a human right that needs to be funded by more developing nations or to help restricted nations get around their. Uh, internet restrictions. So if you believe the proposition has proven their point, raise your hand and hold it up while we get a count. Yeah, we'll both do this, right? No, you guys can't vote. <laughs> hold up really high.
publishers. You get 25? All right, hold them up again. <laughs> One of us can't count, it's probably me. Um, opposition has made the stronger argument. Please hold up your hand. today. Be aware that I do read all of these things and I look at them for critical thinking skills. Uh, the other things that I grade them for, check your, your Moodle and you'll see there's a rubric and it gives you information on how I weight everything. There's 10 points for a certain thing, 10 points for another thing. Helps you to understand the whole process and help you develop your arguments. Thank you everybody. Also remember, domestic worker project survey, get moving on that. Um, Keep in mind, pop quiz can come at any time, right?